Welcome to the Experts in Sport podcast, brought to you by Loughborough University. This podcast seeks to bring together the worlds of academia and professional practice. If you're interested in the latest research and trends in sport, then this is the podcast for you. Hi and welcome back to Professor Paul Willeman. Hi there. Thanks for coming back on, it's good to see you. For those who don't know, Paul was our first ever guest on the podcast, so episode one, Sports Psychology at the Elite Level, where we talked about the role of sports psychologists and how the roles evolved over the years. It was very well received, so if you haven't already listened to it, go and check it out. But today, as part of our series on the psychological life cycle of an elite athlete, we're going to be talking about the psychology of becoming an elite athlete. We'll discuss the athletes transitioning from junior to senior levels in sport, along with all the factors that might affect the individual's psychological well-being and how athletes can be supported during this transitional period. But before we get into that, Paul, can you provide us with a brief introduction and any updates since the last time we met? Well, nice to be back, actually. Yeah, background, I'm educated as a clinical psychologist, been working in uh, sports psychology for the last 25 to 30 years. Full professor of sports psychology at the Free University of Brussels, the Vrij Universiteit Brussels. Also visiting professor in Loughborough, which I really, really enjoy being here. It's one of the, the highest accolades I think uh, we can have a sports psychologist to be invited to Loughborough, which is nice, uh, with the colleagues, uh, with uh, Chris Howard, for example, and Carl working and the students and uh, all the colleagues so uh, since last time I've been involved still with the Dutch Olympic Committee uh, work as a team psychologist for Team NL I've done this for uh, eight and a half years up until uh, Tokyo so did the uh, Rio games and the Tokyo games as team psychologists for the Dutch. The Tokyo games went uh, fairly well uh, when we look at the middle table. Ended up uh, seventh before uh, the bigger countries like uh, France, Spain, Italy and Germany. So uh, the Dutch were really pleased with that. But uh, I must say after eight and a half years, uh, it's, uh, it's a 24-7 job. I said, uh, let's uh, end on a high note. Let's uh, do the transition out of my uh, career as a team psychologist for the Dutch. And, uh, well, two days later, I had a, a little uh, WhatsApp meeting uh, with uh, the technical director of the Belgian Olympic Committee saying, hey, Paul, that's uh, interesting. Uh, what are your plans? So since uh, 1st of October, I've been now the, uh, the expert psychologist for Team Belgium, which is a nice change. Ah. Back, back to my home country. Very nice. Yeah. In, interesting change. And you obviously mentioned transitioning out. We've also transitioned in there as well. And I think in another podcast we'll touch upon transitioning out. But for now, I think we're going to focus on transitioning in. So can we? Can you kind of just describe for us what we're talking about when we're talking about becoming an elite athlete or transitioning from junior to senior? Can you provide, provide us with some examples and maybe ages of the types of athletes and what they might experience, just as a broad overview? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, wonderful question. Uh, do we have uh, five or six hours to uh, <laughs> present, Mark? Well, anyway, uh, the junior-senior transition is what we call in uh, psychology a normative transition. It means that all athletes will face that transition when they develop further in their athletic career. Some way, uh, may do this uh, transition at the age of 18, some in other sports even later 23 but all programs all uh, ngbs have a, an institutionalized transition from junior to senior so what's the relevance well the relevance is first of all that the junior category is recognized as being also an elite sports category which means that most of the juniors the finally a junior athletes will try to give their best shot because it prepares them for the first year at senior level it may prepare them for a, a, a semi-professional professional contract it may prepare them for the transition from a secondary into higher education to university. So it's, it's a transition which is not only normative, institutionalized, but it's also a transition where, for example, the identity of athletes change. Uh, finally, a junior, you may have been the best of your age category. Uh, you go into senior level and suddenly you're just one of the senior athletes. It may have a little bit of an impact, a positive one and uh, perhaps a more negative one. Uh, but at the same time, so uh, especially for those who make that transition at the age of 18, there's also that transition from uh, secondary to higher education. There's at a psychological level the transition from being, let's say, an adolescent to a young adult 
There's a transition going on from a family who have been taking care of you since the beginning of your sports career, financing, support, logistic, emotional, and suddenly you're uh, transferred uh, to another club or you're uh, going into higher education, you're away from family, so the, the psychosocial network changes. The financial system may also change. You may perhaps have a contract first year contract and the legal state is also independent of whether you're a, an athlete or not but legally we change also in what we can and cannot do at the age of from going from minor to adulthood in the law system so uh, the junior senior transition uh, is really uh, so specific because uh, at the same time almost in parallel there are different transitions going on and that's one of I think the explanations why in, in research we found that one in three will make that transition and develop further at senior level. The, the two and three will make perhaps that transition, but after a couple of years will be challenged or, or drop out and not make the senior steps into international, Olympic or Paralympic level. So that's why it's a very important one, the normative. There's another normative, and we'll probably talk about this a little bit later, that's the end of the career. Everybody in an athletic career will end her or his career somewhere. So those are normatives, uh, just to... To give you an example, a non-normative is an unexpected one, like injury, like sudden deselection or loss of contract. But the normative, and that's why the junior-senior, together with the end of career transition, is the most important one when we look at it from a, a psychological, psychosocial point of view. Brilliant. You've teed us up for the next podcast that we're going to be doing as well on uh, on transitioning out so retirement type things and you've you've touched upon many of the points in the the model that you developed so can you talk us through the holistic athlete career model just again as an overview of those areas and then i think what will be best to do is if we then dig into each of those areas in a bit more detail i do love a framework to help us kind of guide the conversation so how did the holistic athlete career model develop and then we'll dig a bit deeper into each element of it <laughs> well i need to go back uh, almost 20 years uh when I graduated from uh, the university, actually the same university where I'm, I'm still at, one of my colleagues, my later colleague, asked me to be involved in a new project which was called Top Sport and Study, which is now called Dual Career Services. And as a, a sports psychologist, uh, he asked me to look at the, the development of those student athletes. And I thought, well, uh, you have that transition from secondary to uh, higher education. But we know at that time there was a little bit of career transition research going on and they said there's a, a developmental stage and there's a senior stage and there's a discontinuation or end or dropout stage and i thought well if i bring those two together i see now that actually the transition uh, secondary to higher and junior to senior actually are in parallel so then i was thinking well i know from research that there are other things going on so i build up the, the model step by step so we started out on the on the top with the athletic career development so we got the initiation young kids are initiated into sports by by their parents by their friends by siblings then you go into what we call talent development club coach or a uh, regional coach says hey this martin he has something there uh, nobody, nobody ever said that <laughs> they should they should <laughs> Uh, if, we, if we can have a little bit more time, more training, more, let's say, almost semi-professional approach to his development, he may make it actually to national, international level, what we don't call the mastery or perfection stage. And then at the end, uh, as a, uh, he will retire as a, an Olympian, perhaps. You never know. So that, that was the basis for the athletic career development. And then the academic one w was simple because I think in Europe we have a, a simple but very straightforward system, primary, secondary, higher education, post-grad, and then the vocational development as an athlete with a contract so that was my second level but in between I thought as a psychologist well we know from developmental psychology there are also stages in our development okay it's a little bit of an older way of thinking but uh, there's still the school child phase at the beginning and then you've got adolescence young adolescent and and uh, adolescent stage and then you go into young adulthood adulthood and senior adulthood so and I put those in the in the model so yes I could almost like a, a jigsaw puzzle uh, without a photo actually but I knew what to do and then I said to myself well one of my topics on, uh, on my PhD was looking at the interaction between uh, young athletes, parents and coaches, the triangle, the athletic triangle. And I thought, well, the psychosocial thing we know should also be in there. So I added a fourth level, the people around the young athlete or the adolescent or adult athlete, how do they change? And they actually change, they, there's a transition going on. And then the, the final two, because it's a, a six level model, the final two 
were added uh, because of my work at the uh, applied side when I was working or for a Belgium Olympic Committee or later on for the Dutch Olympic Committee. The financial side, although it's not a psychological one, but the consequence of the family investing in their children, investing between uh, accolades. The, even the uh, retiring athlete who has not enough money in the bank to actually make the transition into a new vocational development perhaps that needs to go back to living in his uh, parental home uh, for a couple of months and so on. So I added the financial development and the input from the NGBs and NOC, the National Olympic Committee. And once again, you'll see uh, a stage-by-stage -stage change in that system. And then the last one uh, was added because of the uh, discussions about transrational behavior, the legal responsibility young athletes have, but also adult athletes, like, for example, the WADA rules, the doping rules, contract signing, and 17-year-old cannot sign the contract, although the contract may be multi-million, uh, it's still the parents. But once they're 18 or older, suddenly they have to take responsibility. And uh, many of those athletes are not prepared to do so or have, do not have the competencies. So the legal framework was actually put there because I know that many coaches and even many athletes do not realize how important the legal status is they have. And when things go wrong, they're suddenly faced with a, an unknown. Uh, just as an example, Martin, uh, in tennis we have travel coaches travel coaches uh, travel with uh, youngsters between 16 17 18 and they travel around the world south america asia europe and so on up until the point that uh, something may happen for example in a country where after a victory the coach says well we won uh, excellent we have a little a glass of cava you know in a hotel nothing particular just a little nip and suddenly you're faced with uh, the problem that in that country uh, minors cannot drink alcohol you think, well, no, no, not well. Indeed, not well. And so there are Ill illegal things which I think that uh, not only the athlete but also the coaches should understand and in combination with all the different other transitions and challenges. So uh, when I present this model to coaches, step by step they say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then at the end they say, wow, should I stay uh, in coaching because if that's my responsibility, well, that's our responsibility as sports psychologists to educate them, to support them in their development so they can manage that more with their athletes, with their teams on a one-to-one -one basis and so on. So that's how the, the model started. I mean, it is exactly it is wow it is it is many people listening those those who are involved in sport may have had some knowledge of, of that kind of um kind of development what's going on obviously there'll be some athletes listening who will be nodding their heads going yep yeah, these things happen you know general population might be thinking well they're so lucky they just get they're just really good at sport they get there brilliant they all get a million pound contract and you know hunky dory now hopefully you, you've kind of started to highlight that that might not be the case and i think it is really important to understand in this phase that we're talking about the transitioning in that there's so many things going on yeah. some of which the athlete may be aware of some of which they they're not but i think having a team of support around them that actually understands all elements of this is is really really important so I, I, like i said before i think the model is is exceptional and it's developed really nicely for us to be able to break this down as a podcast and talking it um individually so if we can dig a little bit deeper through each stage of it when we're talking about the athletic stage what are the kind of experiences that students or sorry elite athletes elite juniors going into senior level are experiencing once they progress from being whether it being at a football academy going professional or whether it be in the olympics or and i know there's different ages that's going on here with gymnastics and swimming and kind of early early specialization careers but what is the experience of going from that junior level to the senior level athletically well in general for example the frequency and number of hours of training uh, will increase although uh, many junior coaches will prepare their athletes step by step to come closer to that uh, level. Uh, secondly, the, the coach will change. You'll probably work uh, with a, the national coach or even an international coach. Your teammates or even the other competitors will change in age. Suddenly you're from a, a junior age category where you compete against 16 to 18 year olds and you go into the senior and suddenly you have a, a 25 or even a 31 year old competing with you or against you. Number of competitions will change and the traveling will increase. So there's, there's a huge change in, in the way the sport is organized. Uh, I would not say that technically or physically uh, many things change because the final year juniors are actually almost at the senior level and some of the programs I've been uh, with in the Netherlands but also in 
Belgium, you'll see that senior teams will actually introduce final year juniors already in the program because of the transition or because they already have the skills to compete at senior level. So in that sense, I think uh, it's especially the organization and the context is really the changer. And that's where we need to prepare them for. And in terms of that, so you're talking about an increased level of performance there as well. And we'll talk, we'll touch upon the psychological and psychosocial momentarily. But with that increased training volume and increased performance, is there also injuries start to occur more in that area? Well, that, that's an interesting one. I've been lucky to be able to uh, look at what we call huge databases, especially from countries who prepare the Olympic Games. And one of the things that always happen is once the IOC decided where the Games will be uh, hosted, the, the national federations or the, the national elite sports governing body will also do specific research in order to ensure that in a seven-year period, because you have seven years before the Games actually, you, you're able to still change or adapt or increase uh, the level of uh, the athletic level of their teams, the host teams and so on. So in that sense, uh, one of the interesting part was that with its huge database from a country, we saw that actually the injury rate in the first year senior year was actually very high but they had the common sense uh, as researchers to do qualitative research and then ask where do those injuries come from and uh, one of the specific points was the training load at senior level increased they were not prepared to but the second point which I think was a uh, real interesting many of the final year junior athletes who made first year senior were pushed by their coaches or their NGBs to be the best in the world because that's the final year you can actually be a, a junior athlete. And uh, with the idea of if you're at the highest level at junior level, you may have more possibilities for a contract at senior level or selection with a national team. So there's an, I wouldn't say a burnout, but an overload in the final year, which athletes took with them in first senior year. And senior coaches were saying, well, our load is sometimes okay. It's almost similar, but they have injuries which it bring along since the last season so we need one or two seasons to get them back to the the level they should be and we actually are able are, are only able to work with them in the second or even third season so one of the elements which i thought was uh, interesting to to learn is that injury in the first year season as senior is not always the consequence of the training load at that moment but perhaps an, an history or even a, a legacy from the, the final year junior. Yeah, so it's really interesting. Training load stuff is, is an interest of mine. Um, I've kind of stepped away from that area. So that increase in training load is, is a big cause of big, big potential problems and people don't see it until much later fairly often. So um, I think that's an interesting element. I mean, not wanting to talk about athletes too much that we don't know, but I think it's a, an interesting one with, with Emma Raducanu. And obviously from what we know, and, and I don't know her at all, but from what I know from the press, obviously she stepped in, she won the US Open with what from what I can perceive as fairly minimal training load and then since then she's stepped into a senior career and she's had injury after injury after injury Be interesting to see what you mentioned there about two or three years down the line because from again from a from a training physiological perspective she appears to have got bigger stronger and her body might be adjusting to that and in a few years time she may hit those levels that she's already hit from winning the US Open but it'd be interesting around some of the things we're going to talk about in a moment so the psychological impact of that you've already mentioned about the changing coach and I don't know how many changes in coach she's had and then there's the financial side where you'll speak to some people who will say oh she's out doing this advertising and that advertising it's her focus and that's been what's challenged but then we also know that careers can be short so you know why not why should she not be doing that and there's so many things and I just think that's a really interesting case study it, it, you know if you could find any of that information or data on uh, that you could really talk about for a long time so moving that forward then what's the impact from that athletic piece psychologically on the athlete? Well, I think, uh, not talking about specific athletes, but I think, that, come back to training load a little bit, training load is not only the physical side, but it's also the, the mental side as an antecedent or a consequence. I mean, you may have worries about the training load, and that will increase the almost the physical load also due to the psychological negativity. But also, it could be a, a consequence uh, that suddenly you feel your body isn't responding to what it should be. Body image changes, and that may have a, a recurring effect on, on the perceived training load. So there's a, a complete interaction. And I understand that we as experts look at our own field, but I think the strongest thing would be to look at this set in an interdisciplinary way before we actually say something to the coach or to the athlete. So at the psychological level, well, transitioning in may have uh, impact in two different areas. First of all, that's always what I wanted to do as an athlete, being part of the national team at senior level. So yeah, that gives me a push it pulls me in, 
It gives me the, the positive vibes. On the other hand, uh, some may uh, feel that after the junior period, there's time for a break, but you can't take a break as first year senior. So there's a challenge between those two. It strongly depends on the quality of the coaching, I think. And I, I regularly say that the, the quality of the psychological development is not only the responsibility of the, the athlete, him or herself, but it's also about the, the guidance, the support, the coaching, the support from the support service of the staff surrounding the team. So in that sense, I think they, they should be able to pick up any signs which may feel or seem as there's a negativity or there's a negative situation. For example, uh, when we did research with the junior to senior transition, we looked at two categories, the successful transition, so those who made the transition and kept on developing at senior level, and those the unsuccessful made the transition, but after one or two years actually disappeared, the two and three and the one and three. If we look at the psychological level for those who made the transition but did not stay in their development, self-belief was not really there. But once again, was that now an antecedent? Was it now the cause or was that a consequence of being faced with something which they could not handle or lack of support, for example? That, that mechanism is not always really so clear. That's where you need to talk with the athletes. For example, lifestyle, although it's what we call a container terminology, you put everything in lifestyle, but yet there's a way of organizing your daily life, time management, planning, uh, and so on which helps you to support your development at elite level. So if that's lacking, that may be a cause of it doesn't go well. And so I should revisit uh, my aims and perhaps do something else. By the way, that's why the dual career studying and sport, actually, there's a, a useful transfer also from research that the time management and studying helps in the planning of the elite sport and vice versa. So there's an interaction there. Doubting, do I have the physical skills? Yes, the, the results aren't there and uh, they're lower than and uh, last year as a final year junior. So am I now getting worse or am I now at the bottom of the ladder and need to take step by step? So once again, the support uh, given and the, the planning and the goal setting is important. Feeling guilty is sometimes a part of, well, my parents have been inv investing almost in me. My siblings uh, were always at the sideline, almost. And now at that senior, I need to show that I'm worthwhile being here taking an extra load on their shoulders and that may once again have an impact on motivation on energy uh, and so on which makes them doubt and and perhaps uh, discontinue and feeling guilt is a perhaps a too strong a word but actually taking on uh, the responsibility of expectation of others feeling alone it was also one because you generally go from a well-known system you developed into junior level with, with other athletes. You're picked for a national team, you travel, you, you move, and suddenly you're with, uh, as I said, with older players or older uh, teammates, but you're not the same generation. You do not have the same interests. I remember one of the uh, football players in Belgium who later made it in, uh, in the UK, came back as a coach for uh, one of our uh, football teams, is now back in, in the UK and uh, he said when he made it a transition into a uh, senior level what struck uh, him was that he came on his bike to the uh, football club and parked his bike next to the Ferrari the BMW <laughs> the Volvo and so on and so on after training they were saying oh let's go have a, a something to drink or on Saturday or on uh, Friday or whatever night they were free let's go out and he said well I have to study and then uh, about partnership roles yeah uh, my partner this and this and he said well my mom and dad so the the it it was a really a change at the psychosocial level and that may lead sometimes to feeling alone feeling not already accepted or feeling out uh, actually outcasted because one of the points that he raised was he came in as the the young promising player who after half a season was actually seen as the best player although senior players were saying yeah but i've been here for five or six years and now suddenly this young guy comes in and he's the the favorite so in that sense there's a, a psychosocial thing going on so yeah, different different aspects, Martin. Uh, but still, once again, I think we need to educate coaches and staff to pick up those signs or be prepared to think about this proactively and perhaps ask a psychologist, a sports psychologist to assist them or the athlete or players in that development. Well, you mentioned there that the psychological and, and we're going to move into the psychosocial as well. And in, in my past, I've been the head of education in a professional football club. And you know, knowing, knowing what I know now, I start looking at some of that and think, wow, these players at 16 years of age were moving. And many of the players that we took on were players released from other clubs. 
So some were from our club, but many were released from another club. And they all moved from all over the UK to come and live in the, in the same digs together. And they all would have this identity where they were previously, especially in their schools and their social network, that you know they're the ones who are going to make it. And all of a sudden, they're in a new environment with a new coach, with new housemates and were in shared digs at the time and things like that. And they're all of a sudden competing. And, you know, reflecting on this, which I have many times, you look at it and you think, you know what, very quickly you could tell the guys who weren't going to go far for many of the reasons you've talked about. And potentially we didn't support them well enough, if, if I'm being entirely honest. I think we've all learned and that's developing in, in professional football now. But that self-identity, how important is that? And, and I think if we touch upon dual career as well, does having that other identity help these athletes instead of just being framed in that one identity of being a professional sports person? Well, I think there are two sides to your uh, story or to your uh, feedback. Uh, first of all, the point is that we shouldn't just have an athlete move into that transition and wait and see what's going to happen. The point is actually not only the model, but actually using the model to prepare athletes. And that preparation is not the day before, not even the season before. So actually the development of what we call competencies, the knowledge, the skills, the attitude, the experience, that should be there from day one, actually, even with younger children. And in a very didactic, uh, responsible way with uh, youngsters, you can work on empowerment also even or setting boundaries or understanding what the changes are in their psychosocial environment not with that kind of language of course but mom and dad will be not there how we're gonna play together with your friends and so on and so on so in that sense I think the basis of this story, as I said, is not a model, but how do we use it to prepare athletes for that kind of normative transition? And that's where not the ones at senior level should take only responsibility. It's actually those at junior or even earlier levels. Those coaches should be able to work with those athletes and prepare them so that once they make that transition and there's a change in the psychosocial uh, environment or their identity, it's not an, an un unknown. They know how to cope they know perhaps talk to uh, a psychologist or, or somebody in their social support network so uh, first of all i think it's more about the preparation than just wait and see there's an issue and how do we solve that issue so the psychologist not be the, the fireman or firewoman person but actually being the preventive proactive side uh, with the coaches and the staff. The identity, of course, will change, and that's not only due to the fact that they change from junior to senior, for example, but our psychological development, and we know this from developmental psychology, our identity will change because youngsters will have the willingness to, to show that they're not still a child, but that is not yet accepted as adults, so they're in between. So they will have a, a different lifestyle, change in clothes, change in, in humor even, change in music, just to be there as a group. So the, the role of the peers is sometimes bigger in identity formation at that moment than the fact that they go from junior to senior level. So I think, and that's why we call it the holistic model. To understand how identity develops and what the challenges may be, you have to at least to look at different elements in their development. If they make that transition from secondary to higher education, at the moment they go into senior level, well, suddenly you have two different contexts changing and perhaps not being at university every day because uh, you have training schedules will impact your identity. Are you now a student? Well, not really, because once in a lifetime you go to classes and all the rest is online, for example. So in that sense, that will also develop or impact the, the identity. So just saying that the athletic development is the highest impact factor... I wouldn't say that. It's it's more than this. And what so like you say, the, the dual identity go, going on there, which can be supportive of of the athlete as they move forward. But I think there's lots of this is happening for people at this age anyway. So many of them may move away from home, new social environment, decreased parental support. There's additional things for the athlete in terms of a change of that support network they had previously, and a change in potentially that coach athlete relationship. So it's enhanced. Have you done any research between the two populations? So is there a difference in in that kind of psychosocial response from athletes and non-athletes? Not particularly. We really focused on, on the athletic population. But we know that in general, and once again referring to developmental psychology, everybody will go through those stages and transitions to some degree. What we actually know if we compare it from the applied side, or that's my, well, uh, applied experience, and to some degree a little bit support 
supported by research is that we see that the focus on the athletic level may actually not hinder but delay their developmental or psychological development. For example, we have research showing that those who go into the centralized system of sports whether it be now a university or a national training center, and work there for five or six years as an athlete, they do not really develop the same level of competencies as those who are not in that centralized system. Because, for example, the centralized system, it's organized for them. You take a bus, the breakfast, training, everything is ready. So yeah, I sometimes say you unlearn self-regulation, while those not in the system who were not selected in, but find a way with working with the, the, the local club coach or with other coaches, suddenly have learned how to develop their competencies because they have to. They have to go on their bike to the training while the, the others are in the little bus to the NTC, for example. So to some extent, if you compare those two, they're still in competitive sports. We've seen, or I think the hypothesis could be, that the downside of the other side of the centralized system may be that we have to bring in psychologists to develop the self-regulation, while those not in the system actually, let's say, in a naturalistic way... This is Think through, through experience essentially that's it yeah. not always but in any way so and the hypothesis is also that what I've seen is that so those, those who were not selected for the centralized system and developed still outside at senior level are stronger and stay uh, longer at highest level than the other ones because of the let's say the, the naturalistic the experiential development of competences which you need at senior level that's really interesting. Obviously, you know, in the UK, we, we trialed things like Lillashaw with, with the football and, and you would suggest that failed. Many players went in there and moved out of there and, and players didn't go through and they, they scrapped that system for the for the England for the England national team. But there are those kind of types of centres still go on to this day and, and potentially have learnt some lessons there. But again, going back to my, my old role, at the time we had a professional football team who lived on campus and we had a very well-known professional rugby team who trained on campus. Um, or we're talking academy level stuff here. And interestingly, from the coach's perspective it was a really different conversation when I was meeting with the coaches because on the football side everything was handed to the players on a plate from the rugby side there was this well if they're coming they're coming they can catch two buses that would never have been dreamt about with football um, and this may have been an isolated incident and football and rugby maybe there weren't that many differences but in my experience the football lads were given everything whereas the rugby lads were purposely challenged to commit and well if they want to play for this rugby team they need to mm. make that commitment mm. and it was a really interesting dynamic and difference from the coaching staff perspective yeah. have you seen that in different sports where there's different things going on absolutely and i won't apologize for just working at the olympic level but i've been working for let's say the the last 10 12 years at the, the highest level and uh, what you see that the centralized system in all sports is now the preferred system which to some degree makes sense from a management organizational even financial perspective or even uh, with regards that you only have one or two uh, high level coaches and you can't have them at uh, two different sides in the country so you regroup them uh, what i think is that we do not do enough to understand what the challenges are of that system or the other side of the coin so sometimes you will have coaches suddenly saying yeah but my team and there was a, a specific example in in hockey in the netherlands my team has unlearned what we would call self-regulation or coping with uh, disruption so uh, the coach said, I'm going to plan in a disruption, unknown to the players. And uh, he had two examples. First of all, he was in uh, in South America with his uh, team traveling. So they went out from the, the hotel, traveled in bus, played. It was, I think, a, a half an hour of bus time they had to do. And coming back, suddenly he said, well, he had said the trip with, sat with coach driver and said, at that distance, you're going to stop and say the bus doesn't work anymore and as a coach I said okay that's fine we're gonna walk back but I'm not taking the lead so that was his idea of planned disruption what we call and see how those players will cope well most of the cold players <laughs> were just sitting there and, and waiting for the the other bus to come or uh, thinking well can we call uh, a couple of taxis and so on and so on until I think it was a captain saying guys this will not work I think he was savvy enough to understand this was a really planned so let's take all our uh, uh, stuff I'm gonna walk 
back. Eh? The other example he gave was they had a, a friendly match against another country in the Netherlands and they prepared everything with the coach, video sessions and so on. It's on the day before. And the morning itself called the captain and said, I'm not coming. I'm too ill. I can't be there. You have to uh, organize it for yourself. And that was really, wow, what's going on here? The assistant coach, no, he's, uh, he's out of the country and so on and so on. So they had to organize themselves. This was his idea of, I think, a worthwhile idea of testing it out. Now, the, the lesson should not be, oh, they're able to cope with planned disruption. The lesson would be, how can we provide a system of development where we do, as coaches, do not have to have planned disruption to test them out. We see that they're able to do this. I must say that there's a difference between team sports and individual sports. I think in individual sports, athletes need to take more responsibility. You can't just tag along with the rest of the team. You have to travel individually, like a tennis player, for example, while in, in a team environment, it's sometimes well organized or even over organized that's fine i do not say we need to go back to prehistoric times and say that's it uh, you're going to do it for yourself no we need to understand what the advantages or the uh, i would say the challenges of that system and i'll give me you uh, i'll give you another example which is not already studied but i think from the applied side was really clear to me you have youngsters coming into the centralized system coming from the club or provincial or regional uh, level and suddenly they're uh, seen or marked as elite level so identity wise is already wow i'm now an elite level athlete i come into the centralized system and suddenly you have not only a, a new coach but you have also an assistant coach you have two physiotherapists a medical doctor a nutritionist strength and conditioning coach and perhaps also a psychologist in an environment uh, which is unknown to you and you live together not only with your friends because many of your friends are still uh, at home you live together with other athletes who are actually at that moment are your nearest competitors because you fight for the same place or in individual sports uh, he or she may be your competitor at national level to get the selection for international one and one of the points that struck me also was not only why do we expect athletes when they live in an NTC be friendly with the other ones because it's like I'm gonna be the diner and we're friendly and on training we're actually competitors so we're competing from the same spot are they prepared to do this and how do we support them but the point that struck me also was that many young athletes who come in into that system suddenly are almost scared by the number of experts available not the coach, perhaps not even the assistant coach, but suddenly the doctor, the physiotherapist, the nutritionist, strength, blah, 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 everything. And some of those players actually say, I have no idea what to do. What should I do? Should I talk to the psychologist? What do they do? And so on. So there was, on the one hand, we think a professional setting, but on the, one hand, on the other hand, a challenge for athletes to know what to do or expect from that professional set. And that's where, once again, I say we don't have to wait until they're there and see that is an issue. We have to prepare them. But we also have to prepare the experts to understand that they're not always seen as the added bonus or added value. So even as a psychologist, why should I expect that when you come in for the first time, Martin, you're very positive towards my functioning? And what could be the challenges and what kind of style or approach should I have to towards you? And is it always seen as a positive thing and so on and so on? So I'm deviating a little bit from your question. No, I, li I like it, though, because, you know, like you just said, I think trust is a big thing in all of those elements. And, and people have had this again. This will be a separate podcast at some time. But the coach athlete relationship is a real strong bond of trust often. And then for an athlete to then step away from that into a new environment where they think, well, my coach is my coach and my psychologist and my strength and conditioning coach and my performance analyst that coach is often everything to them and then all of a sudden they're stepping into wow this guy no my coach is my coach and then all of a sudden no the strength and conditioning coach knows more about that than him does he and then it's such a such an interesting dynamic and i suppose as you're talking about there there could be an element of well can we just introduce them to one new person and then maybe another one and then and then steadily grow it and maybe that would would help but it's it's a very interesting dynamic that, that people come across and you've talked about lots of people being part of these centers now and obviously Loughborough is a center for many, many things and people get academic and, and kind of vocational training. And I think some of the evidence that we have would suggest that athletes coming in here actually perform very, very well and actually outperform many of the normal students in terms of their academic progress. So we're talking about that dual identity. They're a student and an athlete. Is it an athlete student? Is it a student athlete? You know, we could talk about that all day. But essentially, on the whole, they do pretty well as students. And obviously, my focus is more on students and the records out there would suggest they do pretty well as athletes here as well. Is that the case across the board in general? 
Uh, it is. Uh, and actually, going back to denomination of the, um, I would say, the identity, is it a student athlete or athletic student? It's still the same person. It could be the student athlete and friend or uh, and so on. So the identity is formed by uh, sometimes the, the way in which we perceive them and put them in a, in a category. But it's still the same person. So we need to be wary that we look at the person, their holistic uh, development. No, the interesting part, and especially with the research we've been doing in Europe since 2012, actually, where I was pleasantly surprised that the European Commission actually funded for seven or eight years programs, research programs on dual career, which was exceptional, not only for the, the, the sum of money, but also the, the topic wise. We've seen that in essence, in, on average, they outperform at academic level the regular student. And as a university, we started in 1987 with our system. At university, we started in 1987 with our uh, service provision for student athletes. And every year we did our own research, as university should do. And we saw year by year that they outperformed at academic level, which means, for example, for the last years, the number of credits they take, they always are successful. If we go back to percentages, uh, we've seen at our university that the graduation rate was somewhere around uh, 70, 96. The graduation rate was uh, around 70, 71 percent for the total population. But for the uh, student athletes, 75, 76, 77, very high. So we actually analysed where does this come from? Well, first of all, I think there's a, a selection... Bursing Sport Podcast, not brought to you by the School of Sport, Exercise and Health Sciences at Loughborough University. ...or have a background that's secondary who prepare them. So that's the that's first point, a selection or, or let's say, an, yeah, a selection issue. The second point is that in comparison to regular students, and I, I don't want to be stereotypical here, but uh, an, an elite athlete will not just say, you know what, I'm going to try one year at university. So you're going to prepare this, you're going to make it perhaps a more clear role, a clear goal, clear decision. And in many cases, you'll have the second factor, the support of family or friends or even the club coach or regional coach thinking with you, OK, why would you go? How will it work? So the preparation will perhaps be stronger and more efficient and effective than other students. The third factor was that at the university, they mostly have a system where they can go to a service provider or a department or a specialist, helping them in the dual career. So talking about how many credits will you take, Mark, and what's your training load, your uh, competition schedule, how can we integrate? That's that's uh, the, the next factor. And, and finally, I think that uh, we talked a little bit about the transfer of competencies between those two, athletic and academic. I think uh, many athletes have learned a way of working on a day-to-day -day basis before coming to university, time planning, for example. At secondary education, you also have to plan your schedule, otherwise you're going to be in trouble at school. So they have perhaps a, a set of competencies which is already better developed than other students when they come to university. That set of combination may, and that's one uh, of the hypotheses, may explain why they outperform the, the average student, which makes me say already 20 years ago to our vice chancellor, if we could provide all of our students that kind of system, or preparation, academic rates will go up. There's definitely potential for that. But you go, going back to what you just said around the athletes and the, the goal setting and potential coping strategies that they may already have from all these things that are going on in their lives and, and have happened before, you know, there's potential that that is the reason. But the other side of the coin, which you also mentioned, you know, again, when dealing with footballers and, and rugby players at the time, and I know this isn't the same all the way through higher education, but people we were dealing with, they had to do the sports course. We didn't have the capacity to let them do anything else. And actually, some of them in reality didn't want to do the sports course. They probably weren't qualified to do some of the courses that they were on. So they were made to do a level three course when actually they should have been doing a level two. So in the UK, that's below higher education. It's level three is the A-levels, level two is GCSE level. But they're all put on the same level three course, which I was always hugely against, but I couldn't do anything about that. And again, the, the athletes who were coming in weren't necessarily ready or prepared for it. But those who weren't prepared got so much support to kind of, in a way, get them through it, that that may be the reason that, that, that mm. they ended up performing really, really well. Yeah. So yeah, it's interesting. It happens at all levels in terms of this support. So 
more support for everybody well also more research i think and refers to the research we've done with the european partners and now with lavora for the next project erasmus research we actually defined what kind of competencies student athletes should have in order to make it a successful dual career so the first one talked a little bit about is the career planning preparation the second one is actually managing on a day-to-day basis so you can plan everything but if it is, if it doesn't go well and do you have the competency to change to interact to talk with people to get support and so on that brings along what we have called social intelligence and adaptability so being savvy okay i have an issue i won't wait until it's too late i know i'm gonna go to this person I'm going to go to, uh, to the coach, talk about this then, and so on. And then the final factor, the fourth one, is uh, coping with emotions, the emotional awareness, because that may have an antecedent or consequence factor when things go badly wrong and you panic and you suddenly think, I'm not doing anything anymore, I'm going to freeze and, and so on and so on. So there are actually, from that European research, the four, four major competences, career planning, career management on a day-to-day basis, social intelligence and adaptability, use your social network as best as possible, and the emotional awareness or emotional management. And that explains to a high degree the success in the dual career. I think that's exactly right. And, and where you've talked about that in you know digging into things we've spoken about before, if you're preparing athletes for that in multiple years ahead, then in terms of an, an emotional intelligence or a, just knowing how to deal with adversity, athletes are in a much better place than general population because yeah. they've had these situations. They know how to, how to talk about it. They're happy to bring it out if they've had that kind of support. Yeah. So it does make sense from that perspective. Well, and, and, and just to jump in, uh, because in preparing this talk, we talked about who's, who should take responsibility. Is it the responsibility of the student athlete or of the system, the club or, or the university? On the basis of that research, we actually developed a, a website, a web tool for student athletes to prepare that transition. So they can check what are my competencies, why are they important, do they, do I have them, how can I prepare more, who are the support network I can go to. So to some degree, it's not only about the organization of the university ensuring that they can do the dual career, it's also by providing tools to youngsters who would do this uh, dual career, but also the uh, the provide the support providers, like family or even the Uh, performance lifestyle coaches what kind of specific areas should i focus on when i work with student athletes at the highest level so in that sense i think we've been able to develop tools so that or the student athlete him or herself or those around them the psychosocial aspects and the final one was actually we'll look at what kind of organizational system ensures much of the success of the dual career and there are specific organizational aspects which allow the athlete to develop a dual career and if it's not there you're going to hinder their development so i think we have a uh, let's say almost in a holistic ec- ecological perspective on on what makes a, a successful dual career and you mentioned the website is this website just accessible to athletes you're working with or is it open to anybody no it's open to anybody and it's uh, because of a, a european project it's in uh, multi different languages oh, wow uh, what's the website called feel free plug it we'll put it out there on the press release as yeah. well yeah well we're gonna uh, it's the www.dualcareerstools.com dualcareertools.com yeah that's brilliant it. we'll put it out there because obviously if this is helpful for athletes then then that, that's perfect i am aware we've kind of wandered a little bit from the model and my my job as i said to you before is to bring us bring us back all the time but there was some really interesting points there i think we've still got two more points to touch upon with the model one of them's finance and, and one of them's the legal so can you talk us through the finance because many people think oh you make it as an athlete and all of a sudden you've got loads of money there's no more worries on that but that's totally not the case for the majority of elite athletes no and especially if we first of all look at the entry into the system and that's where the the models certainly for coaches and athletes suddenly they realize how strong the influence of the impact of the family is i sometimes call the family the unofficial sponsor of talent development without the family the close family or even the siblings understanding that a brother or sister is actually developing really well and providing time and space and money and number of holidays not being there and so on so in that sense from the financial logistics side the role of the family in uh, going into talent development and even for some sports going into the national level is super crucial and that's why i'm not in favor of saying well uh, family and parents they're uh, 
disturbing the organization, we'll leave them out. No, we need to find a way of integrating in a specific way their support because they are there, they are helping us to help the athletes. But at the other side, when transitioning out, as you said, some of the athletes do not have in the bank account enough money to make the transition between end of athletic career when their contract ends and a, a new vocational development, a new employer or employment. So some of the athletes had to go back living at home in their childhood uh, room for a couple of months until they find a new job. Now, w what I've seen is that uh, partly due to the research, but I think partly also to the emphasis we put in Europe on the holistic development, some countries have now uh, a credit system for athletes who end their career and they will have a full two years or full two season the same support as they would have when they are active even the financial support system so it's not a credit line you have to repay it's actually the input of the uh, noc or the elite sport organization saying our responsibility does not end the day you say i end my olympic or elite career we have to invest until you have a new vocational development. And on average, it takes two seasons for somebody to go into a new employment. And I think that's it's a wonderful thing to do. Although once again, as with all organizational matters, what may be the challenge of bringing in the money? Some will now say, yeah, but if you bring in the, the certainty of having that uh, financial support, will they now go out and look for a job or not? Or just <laughs> serve on that two years? So it's perhaps, a valid point. <laughs> uh, well, 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 perhaps valid. But once again, okay, what what does it mean for the support system? How do we uh, help them looking for a new job? How do we follow up and so on? In that sense, I think that the financial system most of the elite sport countries are now providing assists the athlete in developing in, through, and out of the system. That's an interesting development, and I think in a, in another podcast we'll talk more about career transitions. But at what point does the organization, the club, the individual take responsibility for entering into, transitioning in or transitioning out is an interesting one. And, and that, that development of that two years in Olympic cycles is, is really interesting. I wonder whether that's developing into clubs and things like that as well. I, I, I'm not sure. I don't think so. It's not due to the lack of, of willingness. It's due to the lack of financial uh, means. Although in professional sports, uh, I sometimes wonder if there's not enough money to do this. But the idea is, well, you're not part of the club anymore. You're not playing. So why would we invest in you? Yeah, which, which I mean, that will go, let's go on to the next podcast with that in the future because that touches upon a lot of things that we could go back through the whole model um, and touch upon. So final bit of the model, the legal side. So where does that come into transitioning into elite sport? Yeah, well, that's, that's a point which I started to raise with coaches due to a, a couple of factors. First of all, the professional of the sport means that perhaps a, a minor, a younger athlete may actually be offered a, a contract, a professional contract, but it's still the parental uh, involvement and the responsibility to sign a contract. But that changes also to some extent, for example, in, in soccer, we had a case where uh, a youngster came to school, uh, 17 years of age, uh, sat in the classroom, hanged in his stool. The teacher was saying, well, did you prepare for uh, today's uh, lesson? And he said, uh, no. And the teacher asked why. Well, last weekend my uh, parents signed a contract, a multi-million contract. I earned 10 times more than you. Why should I study and why should I stay at school? It's not stereotypical. It's, uh, it's one of the exceptional cases, but it sometimes occurs. The point is that the legal status may change with contracts. The legal status change uh, or the obligations when uh, the water rules are in place. And uh, it's not about, oh, but the doctor will tell me what to do. Mm. When push comes to shove, it's your responsibility. Finding the possibility of understanding why transgressional behavior occurs between uh, an adult and, and a minor in, in the sporting context. Why does it occur? And sometimes the adult would say, but he or she looked adult. It was consenting. Uh, yes, the, w what was the issue? Well, the issue is that by law in different countries, uh, you cannot have the intercourse and so on, even in between minors. I won't ask you to answer, but Martin, but uh, at what age can a minor have sexual interaction with another minor? Which, by the way, will happen if you travel with, with youngsters. Uh, it's not unusual, mm. uh, but still, from a, a legal point of view, there may be uh, challenges ahead when problems occur. So in that sense, I think there are different elements to the, the legal side which are not all understood 
or taken into account or not learned uh, about by uh, athletes or even coaches do not understand or what the legal responsibility they have. So that's why I added that, uh, that legal level and actually said because uh, it changes in different countries. Even in Europe, the, the legal status of a minor and an adult may change a little bit. So for example, at what age can you learn to drive a car when you're a, a youngster? In some cases from the age of 16 when there's an adult in the car, not in the weekends, not at uh, an evening. In other countries, 17 or 18, so it may differ. So in the model, it's actually, there's a gray zone between 16 and 18 years of age. Yeah. Up until 16, on average, it's fairly similar. What uh, minors can and cannot do. From 18 years of age, the senior, the adulthood, it's fairly similar. Pos the position between those two may be drastically different in countries. But there's, there's lots of situations that have, that have changed and adapted. I mean, you mentioned alcohol earlier. The changing rooms is a really interesting dynamic. So, you know, I started playing football and not elite level football, but with adults when I was 15. I was in male changing rooms at the age of 15 playing a higher standard of football with, with men. But nowadays, you, you shouldn't be in the same changing rooms. You'll have 16 year olds who might get trained with the first team at football. And again, having to make sure they're in different changing rooms and those kind of things is, is logistically sometimes challenging. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you look at Jude Bellingham at the moment, who's absolutely performing for England, and he was 16 playing a you know, full season for, for Birmingham City. So th there's many challenges in, in that aspect. 16 year olds being responsible for knowing what's going into their body when they're working with a physio and a doctor and, you know, maybe given supplements or anything like that but actually legally they have to take the responsibility. It's, again, there's such a minefield that we're talking yeah. about. We've been through fairly extensively the whole model, you know, and we're trying to frame it to say, well, there's all these things going on. What are the outcomes if people cannot manage all of this that's happening in the transition? So what kind of things do you see manifest in those who, who are really struggling to do this? And then we'll touch upon how we may look at developing the athlete to cope with them. Well, I think, first of all, uh, to, to reassure you, there's nobody in the world who face all those <laughs> challenges at the same time in the same uh, manner. It may actually be very rare. So the model is sometimes too elaborate. Uh, and as I said, sometimes coaches think, well, if that's the case, why should I stay in coaching? Or even athletes say, wow, is that my future? Uh, <laughs> how can I prepare? So no, it's about creating awareness. It's about creating the opportunity to talk about different things and actually we use this model in skating between coaches and 16-year-olds, uh, and they each prepared their own vision with this model, and they sat together, and suddenly the coach realized, hey, this young athlete really understands what's going to happen, or actually has good uh, initiatives to develop further. And young athletes may understand better why a coach emphasizes one particular area of their development can then motivate or provide arguments why other things are important. So it's it's a model, it's more of a tool to be used. Uh, that's the first part. So understanding what's happening, what may happen, what the challenges are. Secondly, it's about, okay, if we know what may happen, how can we prepare the athlete or even give the coach the competencies, the tools to prepare those athletes. Okay, so it's a, uh, I would say only an educational tool, but it's a, a proactive may way of preparing for the next transition. Okay, I want to say you cannot provide competencies for everything that's going to happen. So there's a basic set of, uh, from our research, 12 to 14 competencies to the, be developed in an age period of between 12 and, and 16, or even in early specialization sports between 8 and and 14 but we there's enough time to develop competencies to prepare athletes for the next transitions not only the senior junior to senior but others also the third point is then uh, what kind of support system do we need to provide if something doesn't go as we thought it would be so you probably work with a a group of experts from the psychological side you will have your your sports psychologist but perhaps also a counseling or clinical psychologist if things go really not well and you go into subclinical issues so the third point is the support network and then i think uh, the final point would be the responsibility of the organization to always look back analyze what's happening 
how athletes, coaches and staff develop and year by year, step by step, improve the system. And for example, being faced with the awkward uh, hypothesis that centralizing is not always the best solution for everybody. And as I said, and, and, and sometimes my colleagues uh, look uh, at, uh, a strange look in their eyes when I say, well, do you realize that bringing in a, a sports psychologist in a centralized system is actually because they do not allow the athlete to develop competencies so we need to bring in a, uh, an expert to develop that competency it's not all the psychologists it's also different levels but having the possibility to look at the model and to analyze the organizational impact and how to manage and to to improve the system I think that's also uh, one of the aims of, of this little model. You, you've already answered some of my next questions, really, around kind of who's responsible, what universities can do, or, or national governing bodies, or, or sports clubs. But essentially, you're saying use the model as a tool and, 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 and almost perform a self-assessment to see where you can stage by stage improve and hopefully have that impact upon the athletes to um, not only transition into but also the impact that that will have in their career and potentially in the future transitioning out of a career in elite sport. We've been through the model really really nicely. So we've looked at the career of, of an athlete getting into it and step by step through your model. I think it's really shown all those things that are happening and how they can be supported. So what's next in terms of research in this space? Where, where are you going next? Ah, good question, Martin. I won't say I didn't think about this. I <laughs> thought about this. I think, as always, with, with different models and different tools like uh, Chris Harwood's 5Cs, we, we aim to develop something in a specific context and area. Well done. You did promise you'd, you'd mention Chris, so well done. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> Twice, actually. Uh, Chris Harwood, uh, my colleague. Now, I, I said uh, when we were talking uh, with Chris uh, earlier on, I said, well, the five Cs uh, or even this model allows you to work with other populations. I refer to the senior citizens who have a, a, a daily lifestyle which may be less positive because they isolate, because they do not interact, uh, social network uh, decreases and so on. So this model could be used to analyze uh, what kind of changes or competencies we can develop for somebody preparing into retirement, for example, or preparing into going from home to a, a nursing home even. I remember a long time ago, and I think it was under the guidance of Stuart Biddle, formerly at uh, Loughborough. I remember that uh, there was a study using the basic tool, the basic model, earlier model, with, I think it was females. It was with an adult population looking at how to bring them back to being active on a day-to-day -day basis. And so they looked at the different levels. Is it due to the athletic sporting level? Is it psychological development? Is it the impact of psychosocial, the family, that they do not have time or whatever? Is it the vocational? Is it uh, uh, different aspects? So they use the model to analyze why adults end up being active or do not come to the point of being again actively uh, into a, a lifestyle which allows them to develop their health, mental health and physical health. So in that sense, uh, as always, I think uh, we need to open uh, research and see whether this little tool or model can be used in different ways, which is not exclusively on, on the athletic or the elite population, in fact. So I think that would be one of interesting points, but whether it's it's my uh, interest, that's something else. Well, it, so it sounds like a call out for, for research and, and you're in the right place. So the School of Sport, Exercise, uh, Health Sciences, I'm sure there may be many people who'd be interested in talking to you about the potential to move this in, into the health space not just at Loughborough but maybe at other places so there you have it there's a call out from Paul if, if you do want to look at the health space using this model then get in touch we'll uh, drop drop your details on things but you can you can find him anyway Paul I massively appreciate the the chat I hope our listeners have really kind of got some depth there around that transition into an elite athlete and given them real scope of the depth that, that is gone into within psychology the support that's out there and for those that might be working with elite athletes have got some understanding of how they could analyze what they're currently doing and hopefully for athletes we'll talk about the, the website again and we'll put that out in a press release so so people can access the website if there are athletes and they want to kind of self-assess and see where they're at so thanks again i'm sure we'll be doing a podcast again soon thanks for listening well martin thank you and as you know you're my favorite podcast host so thank you <laughs> thank you Thanks for listening to the Experts in Sport podcast. If you'd like to get in touch, then please contact me, Martin Foster, at m.foster at Thanks for listening. See you next time.